and welcome. In our lesson today, we are going to discuss the external and internal structure of a leaf. So stay tuned. Now, a leaf is a thin, flat organ. What do I mean by an organ? Simply means that it contains various tissues. The main function, of course, of the leaf is to carry out photosynthesis. Now, the leaf is usually attached to the stem or branch of a plant. In the case of dicots, leaves are attached by a structure known as the leaf petiole. This is commonly referred to as the leaf stalk. In the case of monocots, the petioles are absent. Instead, what they do have is a modified leaf shape. Now, another feature of the leaf is the lamina. So the lamina is the green flat surface of a leaf. Now, in most cases, not all, but most cases, the lamina tends to be green in color due to the presence of chlorophyll molecules. Now, another feature is the margin. The margin simply refers to the edges of the leaf. The tip of the leaf is referred to as the leaf apex. One last thing regarding the external structure of a leaf is the veins. Now, veins are very important because their main function is transportation of substances. But the way that veins are arranged is different among different classes of plants. For example, in dicots, you'll find that their leaves have a thick midrib that runs through the center. And then you have smaller veins that branch away from the midrib, forming a network of veins. This arrangement of veins is known as network venation. In the case of monocots, there is no midrib, but you find that the veins are arranged parallel to one another. This arrangement is known as parallel venation. And that is that with regards to the structure, external structure of the leaf. Let us proceed to the internal structure. This is the main part of our lesson. Now, if you were to take a leaf, cut it at an angle, and then observe the cross section under a powerful microscope, this is what you'll actually see. So all these structures that are visible right now are what you will see if you were to observe a cross section of a leaf. Now I know that might seem a little bit difficult to comprehend, especially when you look at how thin a leaf is, but it is the reality. So a leaf contains all of these different tissues. Now by the end of this lesson, not only would you have known what these structures stand for, what their function is, but you will also be able to tell what or how these contribute to the overall functioning of the leaf. Now let's start with the uppermost part, the cuticle. Now if you look at the cuticle, by the way, you'll note that the cuticle is found on the upper and lower surface of the leaf. Another thing you'll note about the cuticle is that it's non-cellular. Non-cellular simply means that it does not consist of cells. It's simply a secretion. Now the cuticle is a waxy, waterproof, transparent layer. So let's start with the first. It's waxy, which makes it waterproof. Now the reason why the cuticle has to be waterproof is that it plays a huge role in reducing the amount of water that a plant loses by evaporation and transpiration. Now there has to be a balance in the amount of water that is taken and lost by any organism. Now, if too much water is lost, for example, by plants, it can lead to extreme dehydration, which can be fatal for the plant. Now, the cuticle plays a role in this by reducing the amount of water that is lost. It doesn't prevent water loss, it simply reduces the amount of water that is lost. Now, another characteristic of the cuticle is that it's transparent, and this is very important because by being transparent, the cuticle allows the light rays to pass to the photosynthetic tissues where photosynthesis takes place. One last thing, one very important last thing about the cuticle is that it also has a protective functioning. What do I mean by this? The cuticle plays an important role in protecting the inner tissues of the plant from number one, mechanical damage, this is physical damage, and number two, entry of pathogens. Pathogens are microorganisms that cause diseases. If you just imagine if pathogens were to enter the leaf, they will cause diseases to the plant, which can be again fatal for the plant. Thankfully, in most cases, this does not happen due to the presence of the cuticle. So those are the three functions of the cuticle. Now the epidermal layer is found just below the cuticle. So we have the upper epidermis located on the upper surface of the leaf and the lower epidermis located on the lower surface of the leaf. 
Now the epidermal layer consists of the epidermal cells. Now the epidermal cells are actually the ones that are responsible for secretion of cuticle. They secrete the cuticle that we've just been discussing about. Now one other thing about the epidermal layer is that they lack chloroplasts. They don't have chloroplasts. The epidermal layer just like, sorry, the epidermal cells, just like the cuticle, play a protective role in that they protect the inner parts of the leaf from mechanical damage and entry of pathogens. And they are also transparent, which is just common sense. So they are transparent in order to allow light to pass to the palisade tissue below. And that is that. Now, one thing, one thing I forgot to mention regarding the epidermal layer is that the epidermal layer, yes, lack chloroplasts, but not all of them. There is a specialized type of cells that is found in the epidermal layer that has chloroplasts. And these are the guard cells. Now, the guard cells are found in the epidermal layer, but have chloroplasts and therefore can photosynthesize. Now, this is very important for the functioning of the guard cells. So, let us discuss more why this is so. Guard cells are bean-shaped cells. So you have a pair of guard cells, they usually occur in twos, and they are bean-shaped. So what happens is that during the day, guard cells, uh, due to the presence of chloroplasts, carry out photosynthesis. This leads to the formation of sugars. Sugars simply mean simple carbohydrates. Now, these sugars cause the guard cells to become hypertonic to the surrounding cells. So what happens next? The guard cells draw in water by osmosis. This causes them to bulge outwards. So when they bulge outwards, they open the stoma. Now the stoma is the opening that is present between the two guard cells when they bulge outwards. Now when the stoma is open, gaseous exchange can take place. This simply means that gases can diffuse in and out of the plant. Now this, coming back to our point, the reason why guard cells have chloroplasts is so that they can carry out photosynthesis, therefore producing sugars, which allows them to control their osmotic properties. This, in turn, con allows them to control the opening and closing of the stomata. Just a brief mention, a singular opening is stoma. More than one becomes stomata. And that is that with regards to the guard cells. By the way, before I forget, I would like to mention this. At the end of the video, if you would like to test your understanding, check out the description box. I will include questions that you can ask yourself to find out whether you've actually understood the concepts or not. But I hope you have 110%. Now moving on to the next one, the palisade mesophyll tissue. Now the palisade tissue consists of palisade cells. Palisade cells, just like the guard cells, are specialized cells. That means that they have a specific function. And not only a specific function, they also have a certain structure that enables it to perform the function. Now, the function of the palisade cells is to carry out photosynthesis. So the palisade tissue is the site for photosynthesis. Now, coming back to the adaptation of the palisade cells, I want you to look at the arrangement of the palisade cells. What do you notice? Number one, you'll notice that the palisade cells are cylindrical in structure and they are tightly packed together. That means that you have one palisade cell tightly packed or tightly arranged with another and another and so on. Now this is to create a large surface area for maximum absorption of light, for photosynthesis of course. Another thing about the palisade tissue you'll notice that is the tissue is located just below the upper epidermis. So the location of the palisade cell is very important. Now this allows it to trap maximum light. Now I want you to think and remember that the upper surface of the leaf will be the part of the leaf that absorbs more light compared to the lower surface. If this were a leaf, this part which is the upper surface will absorb more light as compared to the lower surface. That means that you need the palisade tissue located near the upper surface to, obs to absorb maximum light. Moving on to the next tissue, spongy mesophyll tissue. Now the spongy mesophyll tissue, 
Just look at the arrangement of the cells. How different are they from the paracel tissue? With the paracel tissue, we talked about the tight packaging of the paracel cells. But in the case of the spongy mesophyll cells, you'll note two things. Number one is that the cells are irregular in shape. And number two is that they are loosely arranged. So you find that because of the loose arrangement, there are certain spaces that are created between the cells. These spaces are the air spaces, or what they're known as intercellular air spaces. Intercellular means air spaces that are found between cells. Now this is not by accident, it's actually by design. So the intercellular air spaces are very important because they allow, they allow exchange of gases within the leaf. So they allow gases to circulate within the leaf. So that is the function. Now spongy mesophyll cells also contain chloroplasts, but fewer chloroplasts as compared to the palisade tissue. Now this is something that you can also observe. I want you to go find a leaf, observe the color of the upper surface and the lower surface. You'll note that the upper surface of the leaf is a darker green in color as compared to the lower surface. Now, the reason is because the upper surface contains the palisade tissue, which has numerous chloroplasts. The lower surface is where you have the spongy mesophyll tissue. Even though it does have chloroplasts, they are fewer in number. Our last one, our last one. We are going to discuss the veins, the veins that we mentioned in the external structure. So these veins consist of the vascular bundle. Each vein consists of the vascular bundle, which in turn consists of two tissues, the phloem and the xylem. Now the xylem transports water and mineral salts. So it actually transports water and mineral salts to the leaf. Why? Because water is an essential requirement for photosynthesis. Phloem uh, sorry, transports the food that is manufactured by the leaves to the rest of the plant. So the vascular bundle consists of these two tissues. Now, from our discussion, from the starting point up to this, you're going to find that you can get several adaptations of the leaves just from the different tissues and so on. Remember at the beginning I told you, by the end of this, you'll find out how different structure or the role that each different structure plays in performing the function of the leaf, which is photosynthesis. So a common question, especially in essays, is whereby you are asked, to talk about the adaptations of the leaves with regards to photosynthesis. Now, all of these, how we have discussed. Mm. I believe except the last one, the mosaic arrangement of the leaves. Now, normally with plants, plants tend to have a lot of leaves. Now, in order to reduce overshadowing, you know, to prevent one leaf from shadowing the other, the leaves are creating, create, uh, arranged in such a way whereby they prevent overlapping of one another, such that each leaf can obtain light for photosynthesis to take place. So this is known as the mosaic arrangement of leaves. And that, ladies and gentlemen, brings us to the end of our lesson today on the structure of the leaf. I hope it's been a productive one for you. See you in our next lesson where I'll be discussing the process of photosynthesis. See you there.